so the ear external ear having two parts the external auricle or the pinna and the hidden part of the external ear is the external auditory meatus or external acoustic meatus. Besides these cartilage and fibrous parts, the external ear is also having some muscular part, auricular is posterior, superior and anterior muscles. These muscles develop from the paniculus carnosus uh, beneath the skin in lower animals. Uh, but almost the auricular muscles are vestigial in human beings. These muscles move the auricle in lower animals. Besides these uh, external muscles, there are some intrinsic muscles also in lower animals which change the shape of the auricle, uh, especially in quadrupeds like the buffalo, cow, rabbit and some other animals. But in human being there are no uh, intrinsic muscles and the extrinsic muscles the auricular superior, anterior and posterior which are innervated by the facial nerve are almost vestigial muscles. The auricle it is having some clinical importance. This part the ear lobule, small pieces of ear lobule are used to demonstrate the lepra bacilli. To confirm the diagnosis, it is used to demonstrate the lepra bacilli and the part of the conca this part uh, which is made of, of the cartilage and skin it is used for some grafting purposes like the grafting on the nose when the bridge of nose is depressed to correct or in reconstructive surgery it is used as skin and cartilage graft. Much of the part of the auricle is made up of yellow elastic cartilage as I have studied already. It is yellow elastic cartilage. So this cartilage which is covered by the perichondrium and tightly ensitated by the skin. When there is bleeding between the perichondrium and the cartilage, it is forming <coughs> sorry hematoma and when this hematoma enlarges there will be fibrosis of the auricle and this type of fibrosis which is formed especially in wrestlers is known as cauliflower ear. ear the cauliflower ear so this is the cauliflower ear and this part is used for the demonstration of the lepra bacilli the vascular supply or the blood supply of the auricle is coming from the superficial temporal artery, a branch of the external carotid artery and posterior auricular artery. The lymphatic drainage
again this is the year lobule So this is the mandibular nerve and this is the auriculotemporal nerve. So this is the innervation of the upper lateral part of the pinna and this part is innervated by the great auricular nerve. So, this is the G A N greater auricular nerve taking origin from the cervical plexus and this is the A T N. a branch of the mandibular nerve, it is taking origin from the two divisions which are joining each other to form the auriculotemporal nerve and encircling the middle meningeal artery. A smaller part this part is innervated by the auricular branch of the vagus nerve and some fibers are auricular fibers of the facial nerve. So a small part is innervated by the facial nerve and the vagus nerve. This part is having clinical importance. When there is infection of the genuculate ganglion of the facial nerve by herpes zoster virus, this part and posterior part of the external acoustic meters are having blisters of the herpes zoster virus. herpes zoster virus. This is the site of the anterior auricular lymph nodes. This is the site of the anterior auricular lymph nodes. This part the blood supply when we talk about the blood supply, the outer or lateral part is supplied by the superficial temporal and posterior auricular arteries. So, branches of posterior auricular and branches of the superficial temporal. So, when we talk about the lateral part, it is gaining its blood supply from the posterior auricular artery and from the superficial temporal artery. Lymphatic drainage is in the anterior auricular lymph nodes and also in the posterior auricular lymph nodes and superficial cervical lymph nodes.
now i will talk about the external acoustic meters the external acoustic meters so again the oracle so look here this is the, the oracle this the oracle again the helix the tragic part or tragus this is the conca and this part is known as ear drum and in medical persons language this is the tympanic membrane known as eardrum so this is the eardrum or tympanic membrane this is placed obliquely in, in this part this part is the mastoid region this is the mastoid region it is having mastoid air cells the a uh, mastoid antrum and in this part it is having additors to the mastoid antrum uh, which i will talk later this part of the ear it is known as middle ear this is the internal ear and from here to here this part is known as the external ear so these are three independent parts three independent parts the external ear the middle ear and the inner ear the external ear is having auricle and external acoustic meters the middle ear cavity of middle ear it is having three 
ear ossicles the term ear ossicle is used for three small smallest bones of the body the malleus the incus and the stapes so three smallest bones of the body malleus incus and stapes these three bones are forming the ear ossicles inside the temporal bone of the skull in the depressed part we can see two parts this part is the cochlea and concerned with hearing this part is the semi circular canal and concerned with the equilibrium and balance forming and it is connected to the vestibular part of the brain stem and this is related to the cochlear nuclei of the brain stem through eighth cranial nerve and leads to the cavity the cranial cavity through the internal acoustic meatus one more connection in the anterior part is the connection between the middle ear and the nasopharynx so this is the pharyngo tympanic cavity also known as auditory tube or we can say it is also known as eustachian tube or the pharyngo tympanic tube okay i will talk in detail about this part this part is the external acoustic meatus total length is 24 mm and this part which conduct the sound waves from external environment through the concha to the eardrum or tympanic membrane which will vibrate in response to the ear uh, the auditory waves or sound waves that will lead to vibration of the malleus incus stapes and finally this vibration of the sound waves is transmitted to the hair cells of this cochlea and finally it is reaching to the brain stem through the cochlear part of the eighth cranial nerve or vestibulo cochlear nerve so conduction of the sound waves from the external environment up to the tympanic membrane is through the external auditory meatus or external acoustic meatus the medial 16 cent mm is bony and lateral one third it is cartilaginous part this part is bony and this is cartilaginous part the bony part is narrower than the cartilaginous part and 5 mm lateral to this tympanic membrane five centimeters lateral sorry 5 mm 5 mm lateral to tympanic membrane the narrowest part 
this part this is known as isthmus so this is the isthmus or neck of the external acoustic meters this part is formed by the tympanic plate of the temporal bone so medial two third or 16 millimeters is the bony it is formed by the c shaped rings which are incomplete rings on the posterior superior part these are deficit in the posterior superior part this part of the ring or the canal is this c is formed by the tympanic plate of the temporal bone and the posterior superior part or ring is completed by this is the ring of the tympanic plate of the temporal bone and this is completed on its posterior superior part by the squamous part of the temporal bone so there is formation of the ring of the external acoustic meters this part is covered in its inner surface by the skin the lateral one third is cartilaginous the final part or the last part of the ring is covered by the eardrum or the tympanic membrane which is placed obliquely and forming an angle of 55 degree with the floor of the external auditory meters this is the floor of the external auditory meters and this is forming an angle of 55 degree so the anterior wall and floor of the auditory meters are longer than the roof and the posterior wall of the external acoustic meters due to obliquity of the tympanic membrane which is placed obliquely it is concave uh, due to its obliquity the anterior wall and floor are longer and the roof and posterior wall are smaller it is due to obliquely placed and forming an angle of 55 degree to the floor of the external acoustic meters so anterior wall and floor are longer in comparison to the roof and the posterior wall of the external acoustic meters this lateral one third or 8 mm part of the auditory meters is cartilaginous so this is bony and this is the cartilaginous part this part is also formed by c shaped rings as we have seen in trachea so these rings are again the floor 
the anterior wall and part of the roof are fo formed by cartilage and this remaining part is fibrous. This part, the part of the roof and part of the posterior wall of this cartilage part of the external auditory meters is fibrous formed by fibrous tissue. This inner surface is covered by perichondrium and tightly covered by the skin. Skin of this part is having hair. So, it is having the hair, the sebaceous glands. the sweat glands, sweat glands are modified as wax glands or seruminous glands in the outer part. So, these are the wax or the seruminous glands. So, wax glands or seruminous glands. Uh, these are also having some clinical importance. The wax is secreted to protect the auditory meters and make it patent against some infections and some liquids, but it can lead to impaction of the wax in this area. So, when there is impacted wax, first the fungal infection and bacterial infection and herpes zoster virus infection should be excluded. So, exclusion of the herpes, the fungal and the bacterial infection will make the final diagnosis of the impacted wax which will lead to blockage of the external auditory meters which will impair the quality of the hearing which will lead to the pus formation and can also lead to the pain. So, when we take the head bath or the swimming, we should always clear this part and make free from any liquid, the water or detergent. So, this is the external and this is the medial bony part which is formed by tympanic plate of the temporal bone and posterior superior part is formed by the squamous part of the temporal bone. This part of the cartilage genus is formed by the elastic cartilage, but posterior superiorly it is formed by the fibrous tissue. Now, this is not a straight canal. This is S shaped, almost S shaped. And oval in its transverse section. The section is oval. When we see the section of the lateral most part, the largest diameter is vertical, but in its medial most part, the transfer the largest diameter is anterior posteriorly. So, in this part, this is the largest diameter. In this part, the anterior posterior diameter is the largest diameter. On the basis of direction, we can divide it into three parts. The first part, the second and finally, the third part.
first part is running medially forward and upward <coughs> so first part <coughs> or first one third on the lateral part is directed medially forward and upward then second part medially upward and backward so this part is running medially backwards and upward first part is running medially forward and upward but the second part is changing direction from forward to backward but running medially backward and upward finally the third part it change its direction dramatically running medially again forward but downwards so this is the direction of the third part this third part running medially forward but downward so this is the third part the second part and the first part again the first part is running medially forward and upward like this i am talking um, the right external acoustic meters running medially forward and upward second part is changing direction medially upward but backward and third part changing dramatically medially downward and forward medially forward and downward so when we examine the external acoustic meters or the ear drum the tympanic membrane we have to pull this ear lobule this ear lobule upward backward and slightly laterally to make this canal straight ear lobule should be drawn upward backward and slightly laterally to straighten the canal but remember always in small children or newborn it should not be drawn upward backward and laterally it should be drawn downward and backward because the bony part is not well developed in newborn and in small children so ear lobule should be drawn downward and backward like this now this ear lobule is having sometimes hair in males uh, especially in some autosomal inheritance but sometimes in layman language it is considered as the lucky person so it is not related to luck it is related to some inheritance diseases and the many ear traits many ear traits are fulfilling the mendelian criteria of inheritance so ear traits many ear traits are related to mendelian inheritance law so this is the anatomy of the ear lobule and the external acoustic meters if you are working as a physician or otolaryngologist or some surgeon or some other medical person or remember always syringing and impaction of the wax in this part uh, this external acoustic meters the entire part is innervated by auricular temporal nerve and posterior part is innervated by vagus and 
fibers of the facial nerve as we have seen already in case of conca. The part which is innervated by vagus, the auricular bands of the vagus, the posterior most part, anterior part is innervated by auriculotemporal again branch of mandibular. This is the, uh, the site of the vagus and fascial and this is the site of the auriculotemporal. When removing the wax or syringing the external acoustic meters to remove some foreign body, insect, some seed, grain seed or some other thing. When this is this part for removing foreign body or some other purpose, there is syringing of the part, it can lead to cuff reflex because the vagus cuff reflex which is known as ear cuff. Muscles of the larynx and pharynx are innervated by the vagus, special visceral efferent component of the vagus either through the vagus or through the accessory nerve which can lead to cough during syringing or removing the wax and sometimes there may be some very serious complications like cardiac arrest because vagus is cardiosuppressant. So, it can cause the life threatening bradycardia and weakness of the myocardium due to inhibition of the heart because parasympathetic fibers which are coming from the dorsal nuclei of the brain stem are inhibited are inhibited to the cardiac muscles. So, there will be weak pumping and there will be life threatening bradycardia and finally, there may be cardiac arrest and may be death. So, always remember this part of the external auditory meters, but slight or weak stimulation of this part can be used to increase the hunger because the vagus is also innervating the foregut and midgut which are involved in digestion and almost all absorption of the digested food. So, it can lead to increased hunger or appetite. In next lecture, I will talk about the middle ear cavity in detail.